This summer, at the urging of a good friend, I signed up for a conference that would take me to Assisi, Italy. Now, I thought I was going to a conference, but found myself on a pilgrimage. And during that pilgrimage, I met some people who struck my heart, who spoke truth, and whose wisdom I want to share as guiding lights for our future. One of the first people I met was Marissa Pallas. We talked about consciousness and what it means in terms of technology, spirituality, sustainability, and happiness. I've had the privilege to sit on panels. The last panel that was discussed was one that got to the heart of technological advancement and spirituality and its concerns during this time of modernization. Um, some of the questions that I've had about this as, this as a young person who's dealing with this technology being integrated into every part of my life uh, would be some of the evident unilateral technological advancement and uh, some of the anti-modern movements we're seeing this rejection to modernization as a whole. And uh, during this, this conference I mentioned some of uh, the writing I've been reading recently, like Leotards and Human, which talks about rethinking modernization for ourselves. And um, one of the quotes I really liked from the speakers was, these things don't have morals and we must give morals to them as we use them. So my questions are, how do we rediscover the spirit in the inhuman or what we consider inhuman uh, in this technologically advanced world? And how do we find a new habiture of the new humanity or discover new words or think about old words to describe this human experience that we all are embedded into? Lila June spoke about civilization, asking us to question the very basis for our understanding of what it means to be human. Her knowledge, her wisdom, I believe, can guide us in addressing how we define development, how we design our future, and how we address the challenges facing us today and in our future from climate change, social injustice, and other ills. The word civilization has a very weighty meaning and feeling for Native American people because for so long we were deemed uncivilized when actually we had incredibly sophisticated societies uh, and, and that much of that sophistication was either destroyed or erased from the history books. And at this time when the so-called civilized man, the Western man, has overtaken the affairs of so much of the world, we are seeing that perhaps it isn't so civilized after all, because there's lots of warfare, lots of poverty, lots of abuse of women, and more and more we are uh, teetering towards barbarism, I guess you could say. And so people are starting to rethink the definition of civilization. They're starting to rethink who really has civilization. And if Western man is civilized, then do we even want to be that? Because it entails so much suffering. And <clears throat> uh, my elders told me that the, the indigenous peoples of Australia, some of these tribes didn't even have fire. They didn't even use fire for cooking or staying warm or what have you. And he posed a question to me that really got me thinking. My elder said, these people didn't even have fire. Were they civilized? And I thought to myself, because I had just read up on their tribe and all the amazing, beautiful things that they can do in terms of healing the body and helping each other and the harmony that exists within themselves and within their community, I started to see that yes, they, they were civilized, they are civilized, and that technology and gadgetry isn't what defines civilization so much. Um, and if we believe that gadgetry defines our civilization, we get into a very slippery slope because then all of a sudden, as long as you're wearing a nice wristwatch and a top hat, you can 
slaughter as many people as you want and still call yourself civilized. So I started to see that a perhaps a more helpful and meaningful definition of civilization is not so much what we wear or what we use as tools or things like that, but it's the ability to have harmony within ourselves, harmony within our communities. Um, and so I look to my own ancestors, the Dene people of what is now called Southwest United States, and I start to think about our civilizations, um, and I start to think about how we didn't have judges or courts or policemen, but we did follow the laws of the rain. And we didn't have light bulbs, um, but we did trust that the light of the sun was enough. And we didn't always have um, air conditioning or heating, but we built our homes such that they were cool in the summer and warm in the winter through passive solar design and efficient insulation. And so it started to help me see that um, my people were incredibly efficient and are incredibly efficient if we were simply allowed to live as what we are. And I started to see as well that it's very important in these times to um, think about how we as Native people have been indoctrinated to think we are uncivilized. And <clears throat> what we're often taught is that our spirituality is inferior, our race is inferior, our language is inferior, and our way of conducting social affairs is inferior. And we've been told this so many times for so many centuries that even we have begun to believe it. Even indigenous peoples at times have begun to believe that we are savage. And we go to all these fancy universities like my grandfather did, like I did, you know, going to Stanford, trying to find civilization for our people in these institutions. And it took me that whole journey to realize that there's no civilization there at all. There's a, there's a hollowness, there's a, there's a suffering that occurs when we eclipse the truth of the Creator, eclipse the spiritual nature of the earth from our equations. And we believe in a reductionist uh, mindset that whose all their knowledge is derived from deconstructing life. Um, and that in this time, some of the deepest knowledge is found through our ceremonies. Some of the de deepest knowledge is found through seeing the earth in its whole and vibrant and alive state. So with that, I would uh, ask us all to think about this question, what is civilization? And in what ways can we place indigenous cultures in their proper place to say that maybe we do have something to offer the world and maybe the western man is finally ready to release its arrogance and learn from other cultures and it's no accident that all of the biodiverse hotspots on the earth correlate with hotspots of linguistic diversity that correlate with the lands that indigenous peoples still have control over. Our ways of living are conducive to life. That's what our songs talk about. That's what our ceremonies talk about. That's why we honor women and place them at the center all the time. Because when we put the woman at the center, the woman who gives life, we put life at the center. If we put the woman on the fringes, we'll put life on the fringes. And life as we know it starts to tatter and fray all around us, as we're seeing with the coral reefs being uh, destroyed and the ice shelves being destroyed. And in this time, it's, it's, it's time to remember the woman. It's time to remember indigenous cultures. And it's time to be humble before nature instead of perceiving ourselves as, as masters of, of her. And so um, with that, I just thank everyone for listening and hope we can 
really pray about that and ask ourselves, what is civilization? CJ saw clearly and spoke powerfully about what it means to be an activist, what it means to take a leadership role in your own life and in the future of our planet. Carl Sagan said a long time ago that we're all made of star stuff, that our bodies, our, the breath we take, the people we love, we all come from the stars, the cosmic stars. Part of that is developing new narratives, narratives that not necessarily counter the dominant narratives, but that establish new narratives, narratives that build on all the traditions, all the wisdoms that are inherent in our human experience. These narratives have to be first and foremost grounded in love, radical love. Radical love means love that you're willing to die for, struggle for on a daily basis, and a love that prevents you from being bought by corporate power, political power, educational power. And by educational power, I mean the very institutions that grant us a voice. We need to reformulate what we think about these institutions and also come up with new paradigms of learning, embodied learning, which are really not new. Ancient teachers felt the need to embody their teachings, to live out through examples, not perfect examples, lived examples. Cornel West says that we are born in feces and urine and are heading toward death each and every single day. I think if we really live our lives understanding where we come from, star stuff, but also the messiness of life, and the struggle that each and every single day entails with that messiness, that gray area. As we progress toward death, it's not the final stage. Death is not the final stage. Because if you have lived a life worth living, a life with radical love, compassion, forgiveness, but also criticism, Criticism of institutions of power, speaking truth to power. That is what constitutes radical love. Speaking out, not on behalf, but for the suffering. Allowing suffering to speak is the condition of radical love. And when we learn how to love radically, we will become happier, we will become more fulfilled, and we will decrease the chance of us being bought in any way, shape, or form. So I think that's what being human means. It's to love, recognizing our conditions of suffering, and doing something about that condition of suffering, allowing that suffering to speak through our hearts, ending in radical and transformative love. Thank you. John Luke spoke with passion and knowledge about the steps that we must take for a sustainable future. Where I live, we unequivocally rely on technology, electricity, and fossil fuels. The major drawback to an industry-driven society is how it affects Earth, specifically the ozone layer. Now, we all understand and recognize the importance of the ozone layer. It protects nearly all organisms from the sun's ultraviolet wave rays while facilitating oxygen. It is the light, carbon, and water cycle. The ozone layer is our life support system, and it's vital for everyone to know that we can either preserve it or destroy it. We have that power. In 1996, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, issued a report of evidence on the discernible influence that humans have on global climate change through emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. The report acknowledged that average global temperatures have risen by about 0.6 degrees Celsius since the mid-19th century. It was during this time that areas such as Britain were enacting great economic growth and technological innovation. Flourishing industries in mining, iron, and engineering would birth many new devices and inventions. These include gas lighting, the electric dynamo, and of course the automobile. Regardless of the timeline, these machines are a perfect representation of how we diminish the planet from the inside out. 
we extract its natural resources from the surface and through our machinery expel waste in numerous forms, whether it be CO2 from the Sinopec factory in China or oil sludge dubbed into a landfill. This problem is not aided by the fact that fossil fuels are in such great demand. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, Americans consumed an average of 391.73 million gallons of gasoline last year. Oftentimes, throughout the bustle of economics, politics, foreign relations, and far less consequential issues that permeate the news media, many people overlook the negative effects of industrial behavior, and thus they don't register the long-term state of the planet, facilitating everything that we do in between each breath of air and each bite of food. Instead of taking preventative measures for the effects of climate change, we ought to take preventative measures towards the causes of climate change. Look to the Climate Stewardship Act that was first introduced in the U.S. Senate in 2003. The act would limit and reduce carbon dioxide along with five other heat-trapping pollutants emitted by power plants, refineries, and many more facilities. And then we come ahead to the Paris Agreement of 2016, which is admirable with its goal of keeping the global temperature below 2 degrees Celsius and striving for a 1.5 degree equilibrium. Moreover, it wants to achieve this through interdependence. Unfortunately, there aren't any sanctioned penalties for negligence in the Paris Agreement. There's no enforcement provisions to ensure that all 195 signing countries were going to follow through on the Paris Agreement's goals. No matter the case, there needs to be more rigidity. What I believe that we should enact is a carbon tax that will make it much more urgent on people to put caps on emissions. And we would be able to decrease other taxes, such as payroll tax. This would be a tax shift rather than a tax increase. Thank you for your time. The conference closed, and the work of carrying the insights gathered from my pilgrimage in Assisi began, for me, with reflections from Marissa. As I look beside me today, I see spirit and friendship and love and compassion and camaraderie. I can tell you that I have been healed during this time with gut-wrenching laughter, just eating gelato and walking around and not even talking about serious things, but just being near people who understand. My sisters and brothers in this moment that keep my heart light and meet me with questions and qualms of our time. In our reflections, we've confided in each other truths and I feel meeting them at this time in my life has been good work. So I wanted to share words I've written down uh, in my book um, as I've been absorbing and uh, taking in all that you have said during this time. Quiet history. Love of creation. Integral ecology. Transformation of policy. Network. Redefining progress. Reimagining the human. Resistance. Divestment. Wisdom. Life and death. Singularity, the Anthropocene, global martyrs, end of the modern world, peace, culture, education, human nature, human to human, human to oneself, the greater community of life, seeds of hope, honoring the miracle of food, corruption as the root for ecological destruction, changes in the mind and heart. service economy, earth jurisprudence, energy, time, and knowledge, renewal of civilization, 
transformation, empowering and mobilizing youth, peaceful, just, humane, constructors of our knowing, imagination, traditional ecological knowledge, scarcity and fear, flash diplomacy, affirmation through storytelling, you are important, renewed sense of hope, radiant light, convergence, live with nature, live with Mother Earth, live together, respect, reciprocity with life, you are water, fire, earth, and air, a reflection of the elements, to be reborn, take care and do not take over, what will you leave behind, how we'd help them if only they would listen. I want to assure you we are listening. <laughs> I, I know that you know that we are listening. Working for the sustainability, happiness, and well-being of all beings on our planet is not easy work. And to do it with integrity, from love, and through humility is even harder. And with my encounter of these visionaries, I have hope.